Shall we begin? Let's. All right. So, yes, it's not today, it's Tuesday. Uh, uh, Tuesday. Uh, we have the next stuff. All right. So, um, we are talking about the simple harmonic oscillator, and as we discussed, it's one of the most important problems in physics. And um, so it's quite important that we focus on it in quite a bit of detail here. And so the first thing that we did last time, and I want to review and emphasize the important points, is just to look at the classical mechanics of the simple harmonic oscillator, written in this particular notation with particular emphasis on uh, um, some of the particular features. So, first thing we did is that we wrote everything in, in terms of dimensionless variables. That's always what you should do. So you should always get rid of the units by looking at whatever the characteristic scales are in the problem. And whatever the problem is, it has some physical constants. In this case, there's two constants, the mass and the spring constant, or the mass and the resonance frequency. And that's it. But So everything is kind of defined in terms of that. Um, and at least that relates whatever characteristic units we have will be defined in terms of those physical constants. So there's some characteristic energy, there's a characteristic plate scale, there's a characteristic momentum. And by this, we have you know, they're loosely related in this way. I mean, the old, whether we put a factor of two in there or not, that doesn't matter. That's because, of course, everything would be rescaled in terms of that. Um, and I keep oscillating, my simple harmonic be oscillating is to decide whether I want to put that factor of two in there or not. Because it, you know, there's no good solution. I stick with this stupid factor of two somewhere. Um, anyway, with that, the Hamiltonian looks like this. It's symmetric. It's quadratic in position momentum. They're, they're completely symmetric. And as I say, whether this factor 2 is absorbed here or put there, your choice. But we'll choose this. So uh, in dimensionless units, then, the Hamilton's equations of motion for the space phase variables uh, have this kind of symmetric form. Okay? And each one of those the uh, canonical variables, the position momentum, satisfy the simple harmonic oscillator differential equation whose solution I've written here in terms of initial conditions the initial condition for the position and the momentum, or I can think about it as the initial amplitude and the initial phase of the oscillator. Okay. So the impo one important point here that I want to emphasize is that any simple harmonic motion, any simple harmonic motion that's oscillating at a, free, a fixed frequency omega can always be thought of as some amount of cosine and some amount of sine. Always. And those are sometimes called the quadratures of the oscillation because they are 90 degrees out of phase one another, so they're said to be in quadrature. So it's like electrical engineering, ham radio jargon. Uh, radio, whatever, but that's what we talk about. We still talk about the quadratures of the oscillator. Okay? Or I could equivalently think about any harmonic motion always can be thought about as having some amplitude and some phase relative to some phase that we call the So either I talk about the quadratures which in this case are the x and p, initial x and p variables, or I talk about the amplitude and phase. And of course, they're interrelated with one another, right? 
So the amplitude is the, you know, Pythagorean theorem uh, length of that vector. And the phase is the argument of, of this, the imaginary part of the ratio of P and X. That is to say, any harmonic motion can always be expressed compactly in terms of a complex amplitude. Okay. So the complex amplitude encodes the amplitude and phase and the quadratures. It's either I talk about it in terms of real and imaginary parts or I talk about it in terms of polar representation of that phaser, right? So if I have a complex number, which is here's my complex plane, it has a real and imaginary part. And those real and imaginary parts are the x and p variables. Or equivalently, that complex number has an amplitude and a phase. Okay? I want you to keep those things in mind because that aspect of the simple harmonic oscillator, that classical aspect, has quantum uh, analogies and quantum features. And they're often forgotten. We learn about raising and lowering operators, but we have no idea what that means relative to classical oscillators. They mean something. OK? So what this says is that written in terms of the complex amplitudes, simple harmonic motion is just the rotation of this phaser on a circle. The amplitude is constant. If uh, given some initial energy, that energy is conserved. And that energy is just given by whatever the, I'm sorry, the characteristic energy of the system is times the square of the amplitude. Um, and the trajectory is thus a trajectory on a circle in these dimensionless units, in these scale units, that rotates at an angular velocity omega. Okay? That's what that means is that the position of the particle, as, as I project on this, is oscillating back and forth. And the momentum of the particle is oscillating back and forth. And they're oscillating back and forth 90 degrees out of phase with one another. Right? So when the position is at its maximum value, the kinetic energy is zero. When the position at its minimum value, the kinetic energy is its maximum value. You know that from basic simple harmonic motion. So that's the classical problem, and I want you to think about it. I want you to think about the complex amplitudes. I want you to think about what the real and imaginary parts mean, what the amplitude phases mean. Okay. All right. So then what we did is we said, okay, now we're going to quantize this. And the way we just quantize it is to just say, now my position and momentum Canonical coordinates become the position of momentum operators, which uh, no longer commute. They're, they have the canonical commutator, and now we have one more constant in the problem, h bar. Before we just had two, mass and frequency. Now we have a third one, the characteristic unit of action. So it's natural to define uh, the characteristic position momentum variables to be related to one another such that they are equal to the characteristic unit of action in quantum mechanics, h bar. And now we got three constants and three characteristic units, and so we can define them. We get the natural characteristic energy scale of the harmonic oscillator, h bar omega, and these are the characteristic scales of position and momentum. Okay. And so expressed in terms of those characteristic units, we now have a dimensionless position and momentum operator. And moreover, we have a quantum analog of the 
complex amplitude. So what was the complex amplitude, a complex number in the classical mechanics, now is a non-Hermitian operator in the quantum world whose Hermitian part is the position and whose anti-Hermitian part is the momentum. Okay, uh, and you will keep that in mind. What is different, of course, in quantum mechanics is that uh, whereas alpha and alpha star were numbers, now A and A dagger are operators and they don't commute. Okay, and their commutator is the canonical commutator. It's another way of writing this commutator. Okay. So expressed in terms of those dimensionless variables, our Hamiltonian, here's our characteristic energy scale, X and P, or in terms of the complex amplitudes, looks like this. Okay? The point is that because A and A dagger don't commute, we have a symmetrized form of what was here. All right? Okie dokie. Um, so there's a new operator that appears, the character, the amplitude squared, the square of the, amp of the complex amplitude, classically, is the thing we call the number operator, quantumly. I think quantumly should be an adverb. Uh, and uh, that thing, the number operator, for reasons that we know, that its eigenvalues are the numbers, the, the natural numbers, uh, has these commutation relations with A and A dagger. And we use them to solve the time independent Schrodinger equation, that is to say, to solve for the energy eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. Okay, because the energy eigenvalues are the eigenvalues of the number operator multiplied by h bar omega plus a half, right? And what we showed in lightning speed at the end of last lecture is that those that number operator, its eigenvalues are the natural numbers, the non-negative integers. 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to infinity. Okay? And so the energy eigenvalues of the simple harmonic oscillator are h bar omega times n plus a half. So the energy eigenvalues are, yes? Are there any other potentials that have the same space in the same way? No. Absolutely. That's a good question, and the answer is no. So, this, as he was noting, of course, what is unique about, or what is what you see about the harmonic oscillator, as in, and in fact is unique to it, is that the energy eigen, uh, the energy levels are equally spaced. They're all spaced from one another, a forming, and that is unique to the simple harmonic oscillator. That is a feature of the simple harmonic. So if you have that, you have a harmonic potential. Of course, the, the lowest energy state is the ground state. And the ground state is the state with uh, n equals 0. And it has an energy that's a half h bar omega above the bottom potential. That's called the zero point. And moreover, we showed the algebraic properties of the A and A dagger, which we call the raising and lowering operators, or lowering and raising operators. That is to say, those operators take one of the number eigenstates and either lowers it by one or raises it. Okay? And of course, 
there is a ground state. That's how we derive this fact. And that ground state has the property that it is annihilated by this. This is why sometimes this is also called another name, and it becomes more important in the context of field theory when these ends are quanta of excitation of the field of our particles, then this is known as the annihilation operator. And A is the creation, A dagger is the creation operator. And with this, these two properties, what it says is that I can obtain any of the energy eigenstates, the number states, by applying the creation operator or the raising operator to the same thing, n times to the lowest energy level, the ground state. And then we have to renormalize it because this is not a unitary. It doesn't preserve the norm of this, and you renormalize it. And that norm is uh, n factorial. It's easy to check. Okay? So just come back to the front board here for a moment. What it's saying is that quantically, whereas classically, sort of any, remember we said the radius of this circle represented the energy of the system. And the system starts there and just rotates that. The quantum state says in some sense there's quantized possible trajectories in phase space, all separated by h-bar omega. Now, of course, that's not exactly true, because I don't know. It's supposed to be a circle, but you get the picture, I hope. Uh, because, of course, I can't be at a point in phase space. I mean, there's a kind of uncertainty level here. And there's some kind of, and we're going to talk about this in much more detail, how to think about this. There's some kind of uncertainty here in terms of x and p in these guys. Okay, But loosely, that's a good picture of what's going on. And the reason you could think about the existence of the zero point energy is as we discussed when we thought about the particle in the box, just from the uncertainty principle. It's impossible to localize at position and momentum simultaneously. The ground state would be just there. That would have that position and no kinetic energy. That's impossible. But the ground state is the minimum energy state that consistent with the uncertainty principle. All right. So far, so good? Very good. All right. Now, one thing uh, we can see from here, firstly, is that uh, uh, what we call the number states, which are the eigenstates of the number operator, which are also the energy eigenstates. Of course, here n equals 0, 1, 2, da, 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 infinity. Form a basis for number space. We know that the eigenvectors of any Hermitian operator form an orthonormal basis. Right? And so what and of course in the context of the simple harmonic oscillator, unlike say a finite square well, all the states are bound. There are no unbound states. So this is the complete basis. So a resolution of the identity can be written in terms of the number states. And that is to say a basis for Hilbert space. And what is Hilbert space in this case? It's the space of square normalizable functions on the real line. That's the Hilbert space we've been talking about for one dimensional mechanics of a single particle. So this forms a basis for Hilbert space, which means that any observable, or any operator, I should say, can be expressed in this basis. So for example, we can write the position operator in this basis. We've written position and momentum 
in terms of continuous variables, the x eigenstates and p eigenstates, but we can, and we often do, write them in terms of discrete variables, the number states. So even if I'm not talking about the simple harmonic oscillator, this is a basis, right? It doesn't matter what I'm, what, uh, whether they happen to be the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. It's always a basis. Yes, Stephen, you have a question. Yeah, I, I know physically the, uh, the annihilation of raising operators cannot hit anything below n equals zero, or yes. But, uh, but my question is, uh, it, it does seem like anything will change if, if, if you make n negative, apart from the fact that you get imaginary terms. Um, the reason that, that those states don't exist is the following. N itself is a positive operator, <coughs> meaning that its eigenvalues have to be positive. And we saw that last time as because if I look at the expectation value of n with respect to any state that is equal to that, and that is equal to the norm squared of this vector, which is always greater than or equal to zero. Yes, but if, if you make n like negative two, but then n would have a negative eigenvalue, and it can't. Okay, so that's how we got to that. All right. Very good. So, uh, so because it's the basis, let's we, let's write the matrix representation of x and p. We could do that. So, what are x and p? How do you do that? Well, whenever you're dealing with the number basis, the thing to do is to express things in terms of A and A dagger. Okay? Because we know how A and A dagger act on this. So how, what is X in terms of A and A dagger? I ask you. A plus A dagger over root 2. Thank you very much. So it's the real part with the factor of two in there that annoys us. Okay? And P is what? The imaginary part. So that's A minus A dagger over 2i, and then there's a factor of root 2 there. So if we know that, then we can express uh, X and P in terms of this basis because we can always write A and A dagger in that basis. Let's do that first. Okay? So let's look at, for example, the annihilation operator in the number basis. Okay? So I'm just going to insert a resolution of the identity on both sides. I'm just going to do it that way. So I'm going to have a sum over n and n prime. And so this is equal to the square root of n, n minus 1, delta n prime, n minus 1. Okay. So this then is equal to the square root of n, uh, but because I can't have n less than 0, this goes from n equals 1 to infinity n minus 1, n. Okay. The case where n equals 0 doesn't exist because that term is 0. So that's important. Uh, square root of n, sorry. And a dagger is the adjoint. Taking the adjective, right? 
Or if I want to just relabel things and start at zero, I can do that too. Okay. Um, Jim, It's just relabeling the sum. So, how did these, this is just expressed as a uh, set of outer products. I mean, you see what this thing does. It takes, it lowers it, it takes n to n minus 1 with that coefficient, or I take n to n plus 1 with that coefficient. Okay, let's write them as matrices. Of course, these are infinite dimensional matrices, right? So, so we can't write down the whole matrix, but we'll write down a few of the matrix elements of it. So our basis elements, 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 Of course, it has nothing on the diagonals. Right? This is row column 1, and column 0, column 1, column 2, that, that. And then it has something on the off diagonals. Can you tell me, is it on the upper diagonal or the lower diagonal? Lower. Lower. Because if we see here, this is row column, right? So it's 1 through 2 through 3, dot, 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 0 through 10. 0 is everywhere. And for a dagger to be the opposite side. Exactly. So a dagger looks like Now these 
are continuous variables. But that's okay. They allow us to write a resolution of the identity. Notice the H bar went away because this is dimensionless students. Okay. Yeah, this looks a lot, this looks exactly like what we did before, but in, in the in the character skill. That's correct. That's exactly what it is. Indeed, let's just just to emphasize the fact. Let me say one quick point. Recall that with the units in the problem, the cats x and p had units, right? So recall, with units, we had these guys. And these are my, my little variables have the units. Right? Which meant that this thing has units of 1 over the square root of length. And P, ket, has units of 1 over the square root of momentum, which is the square root of A bar L. Okay. So I can define the dimension full ket. In terms of the dimension less cat as one over the square root of the characteristic unit, where x is equal to x c times x. Now this thing has units. Or said another way, the dimensionless cat is related to the dimension full cat by getting rid of the units. Then, when you do the change of variables, this will get you back that. So, 
you know, if I look at, for example, x prime in the dimension full variables, well, they said that was h bar over i d by the x delta x minus x bar. But if I wanted to do all that re-expressing over here, this is going to be, you know, Ah, I don't want to go through it. You see, there's going to be a root 1 over root 2, 1 over root x. That gives me xc, put it over here. And then I get a p, 1 over pc, and I get my h bar. Okay. All right. Uh, moreover, of course, what we have is that I can talk about position and momentum representations. Okay. I mean, let me just quickly go back over here before I said it. Of course, with, in the number basis, what that means is that I can write any the state as an expansion over the number eigenstates. And the C sub n's are just the probability amplitudes in the n basis. With respect to the continuous variables, we have a similar thing, but I can write every side as a superposition of position eigenvectors that way. Or momentum eigenvectors, where those are the position and momentum wave functions. So psi of x. that, which if I wanted to write it in dimension full form is that times that, or it was a dimension left, full variables, gets rid of that, and the momentum space weight function in dimensionless variables is that. Finally, what about A and A dagger? Um, well, to do that, well, what I can see is the following. Let's let me first say the following thing. If I look at uh, the momentum operator acting on the state and look at the weight function, you know, of course know what we get. We get the derivative with respect to x. That's the momentum operator is a derivative operator. Acting on the weight function, or in momentum space, the x operator acting on the state looks like a derivative with respect to p. To the other side. So what about the creation annihilation operator? or raising and lowering operators. What do they look like in position momentum space? Well, they are combinations of x and p, so let's just do it. So if I look at, suppose I look at, I take the annihilation operator and I act it, or the lowering operator and I act it on the side. What is the wave function I get? Well, to do that, I look at the position representation. So that's equal to the position represent A is x plus i t over oh, okay. root So this is equal to x I'll just write it all out. 1 over root 2 x hat plus psi plus i t on psi in the position representation. So far, so good. 
What is this? Is that it's x times a wave function, right? And what is this? It's the derivative, right? The momentum operator in position space is the derivative. And all these x's are the, the, the oh. new? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Dimensionless. Everything's dimensionless. Sorry. Yes, pardon me. Let me be quite much more careful about my notation here. Sorry. Plus I times the derivative with respect to x. Okay. So the, in the position representation, the annihilation operator acting on this is x plus the derivative with respect to x acting on the wave function. What about the moment, and of course, a dagger is just the adjoint of that, and the adjoint of the derivative is minus the derivative. in momentum space. What are the position the creation violation operators look like? symmetric in x and p, except an overall fact from I spoken around there. Okay. And of course, a dagger if you put the minus sign there. Very, very good. Um, Alrighty. So, given that, um, how do we find the position or momentum representation of the energy eigenvectors. That is to say, the wave functions that are the energy levels associated with the energy levels of the simple harmonic oscillator. We could. So one way we could do it is that we could express, you know, so we seek the position or momentum representation of the energy eigenvectors, right? Now, one way we could get at them is to solve the differential equation, right? 
I agree with Keith, we win. <laughs> but I agree. Uh, and so, you know, sorry. I mean, what that would, you know, one way is to say there's a differential equation. In the position representation, we know that uh, Oh, well, this is me. Got rid of the units there. H bar omega on the wave function. So this is the time, this is H psi equals E psi. And, and we could just try to solve that differential equation, which is, a, uh, which is the way it's always done, or used to be always done, in introductory quantum mechanics. You plug in a power series, and you'd see the power series eventually has to truncate because you can't satisfy the boundary conditions unless that. And that's one way to get at the um, eigenvalue equation that we got algebraically, just based on the theory of operators and positive operators and so forth. But another way is to use the one thing we know which is that there is, for the ground state, we have a very simple equation. It says for the ground state, we're annihilated by the uh, lowering operator. And we can express this equation as a differential equation. And just solve that. And once we have the ground state, we have all other states. Because all other states are obtained by just raising that n times. So what we're going to do is do that. Much easier. And let's just do that. But I agree. This is, you can do it, and that's perfectly correct. Thank you. All right. So how are we going to solve this equation for the wave function? What we seek is the lower the, the wave function u zero. Ground state wave function. N would be zero. Yeah, so n would be zero. So we don't want to solve this equation, we want to solve that equation. So how are we going to use this equation to find u zero? Then it was zero a dot. Uh if I did that, I'm going to get zero equals zero. So you Say, say again? Yeah, I want to express this in the position representation. That's what I want to do. I want to look at this equation. Because that's going to be a differential equation. And we have that over there somewhere. The annihilation operator in the position representation is equal to um, 1 over root 2 x plus the derivative with respect to x on the wave function, which is what we're calling u0. All right, good enough. plus v by dx 
on the ground state wave function is zero. So that's a simple differential equation we can solve. I hope we can solve it. Of course, this is really in 1D without time dependence. This is this. It's in OPE, not a PDE. So how do you solve that differential equation? Separate. Separate variables. Thank you very much. Right, this says that the derivative with respect to x is equal to uh, minus x. Not, which says that the integral uh, du not or u not to minus the integral dx x, which is minus a half x squared. And this is the natural log of u naught divided by some constant, so it a. So we have the solution. The ground state wave function is of this form. Recognize that function? Oh uh, yes, yeah. that's like a homework. What is it? It's a galaxy. It's a galaxy. That is a galaxy. How do we find this constant c? Normalize it. Normalize it. Thank you very much. Excellent. And 
putting in what xc was, the characteristic unit. Remember, xc was the square root of h bar over m omega. This is equal to h bar over m omega times pi to the one fourth power e to the minus a half m omega x squared over h bar. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I guess classically, think about a harmonic oscillator. I would expect it to be most likely to be found where its speed was approaching zero at the ends and not in the middle where its speed is the highest. Indeed, that is an excellent piece of observation. And that is something uh, which is saying that this kind of motion is extremely non-classical. Now, I was going to save this for the next lecture, but let's talk about this now. So, well, just, let me hint at something. So, as Zeke was suggesting, let's think about a pendulum. Right? A pendulum, that's a simple harmonic oscillator, spends a lot of time at the turning point and then steam through the center. So you kind of expect the highest probability for it to be is at its turning points, and the smallest chance of finding the particle to be in the center. And this is the opposite. If I look at the wave function. Is it because here, what is at the tip of the swing, is it's position very uh, narrow, but so it doesn't must go become very large? No, it's, you cannot talk about, the problem is, you can't talk about the position and momentum simultaneously. Classically, so this is this wave function, it's supposed to be a bell shape, right? This is the square of the wave function. So classically, We could talk about the position at a particular position, I mean, the momentum at a particular position. We could do that classically because we could talk about position and momentum simultaneously. And what is that given a certain amount of energy? Well, it's whatever the kinetic energy is at that point tells me the momentum. So that's the square root of 2 n d minus right? So where the energy at the turning point, the momentum is zero, right? And you expect it to stay there a long time. Now, what we talked about, very briefly, but we did talk about this, is the WKD approximation. The WKD approximation is a way of writing down the wave function when the momentum is large compared to the characteristic scale of change of potential. So when the de Broglie wavelength was tiny compared to something having to do with The, the rate of change of the momentum. In this case, this is the spring constant. So for very, very short wavelengths, which in this case means high energy, we expect the following to be true. That this is equal to 1 over some constant, normalization constant, divided by the square root of the classical momentum e to the i integral the classical momentum integrated. Remember this? So 
So this is a semi-classical approximation. So we expect this to be true, which is to say that for large energies where the, the Morley wavelength is very small. So here's my harmonic potential again. We have the ground state. The ground state wave function looks like that. We'll talk about the intermediate cases in a moment. But if I'm at large n, Well, then this should be an approximate, good approximation wave function, which means the wave function should have a lot of its probability amplitude where the classical momentum goes to zero, and very, very little of it. So, so up here, I mean, classically, the probability goes to infinity, small number here, and then very high. Yeah, this is the classical probability based on this amplitude. And what we get is something that looks like this. It's supposed to look symmetric, I'm sorry. So, in the limit of large quantum numbers, that's to say a high energy, we have the situation that you intuited and that you expected. The probability amplitude should be very high at the classical turning points and very small at the place where it's speeding by the fastest. The classical dynamics is informing in some way what the wave function is, okay? And we saw that in a few lectures back when we looked at how the amplitude I mean, uh, and phase of the wave function obey the equations that were the classical Hamilton-Jacobi equation, okay? So this is sometimes known as the correspondence principle. Now, I want to, we're, going to be, we're going to talk about this a little bit more and try to understand that somehow at the limit when, for, as n gets large, or I should just say en, whatever the potential is, en is large, you get to the classical limit. Now that's, I don't, what we mean by classical is, a very slippery term in the sense in which this state is supposed to be symmetric, excuse my horrible drawing, uh, is a classical state. Well, that we can think about the semantics of the word classical. But what is certainly true is that this is true. That's to say, the wave function is well approximated such that its magnitude is guided by the classical trajectory. But for short wave, I mean for long wavelengths, for low quantum numbers, the wave nature of the motion dominates, not the ray trajectory, in which case it has nothing to do with the classical trajectory. Nothing. Excellent, excellent observation. All right. So we have the ground state. What about the higher excited states? Well, firstly, what can you tell me just from what we know about the nature of the potential and the solutions to wave mechanics in 1D about what you kind of expect the wave function to look like. It's got a node, right? Yeah, it's got another node. 
So you kind of expect it to look something like that. Right? And then what about the next excited state? I mean, it's supposed to be like that. Like three Gaussians in a row? Kind of like, you know, something like this. And you know that this is symmetric, anisymmetric. Symmetric, anisymmetric. Blah, blah, blah. This is really symmetric. Okay? It could be an anti-symmetric one, too. Why, are I, why am I saying that the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian are necessarily symmetric and anisymmetric functions of x? Because the potential is symmetric? Because the potential is symmetric. The potential is reflection symmetric, and thus we know that the eigenfunctions are eigenfunctions of parity. All right, very good. We're learning something. Um, Okay, so um, algebraically, we have this, okay, which means that. Um, the nth energy eigen function is given by is the nth power of a dagger, which is over there, a dagger in the x representation. So this is 1 over the square root of n factorial, 1 over the square root of 2 to the power of n, x minus d by the x, n times acting on do that. And it's a pain, but the answer is that this time, every time I take this and do this derivative, well, I'm going to get the Gaussian back, right? Because you take the derivative, you get the Gaussian, and then you're going to get some derivatives of the things in the exponents, which are going to be polynomials in x. And so this thing is equal to some polynomial, the end polynomial, x time times the Gaussian. And these polynomials have a name, they're called the Hermit. Not the Hermite, but the Hermit polynomial. to double check the facts because the Hermit polynomials have a certain fact in the front. Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot that stuff, the square root of pi thing. So this is equal to this. One over square root of two, where am I going to So by definition, I could write the Hermit polynomial as what I get when I take this derivative n times on the Gaussian and then get rid of the Gaussian part. Okay. So, uh, here are some of the primary polynomials. H0 is 1. H1 
one is linear. H2 is quadratic, etc. Notice they alternate from even to odd functions. So H and do the reflection symmetry, I either get plus or minus back. And this is what they look like. You take those polynomials, you multiply them by Gaussians, and you get these are the eigenfunctions of the simple harmonic oscillation. Now, I'll leave it as a simple exercise for you. To show the following. that in the momentum space representation, so I, I should, and then before I do that, let me just quickly say, so what we have here is that in the, in the position representation, un uh, is equal to some normalization constant, a sub n, times a Hermit polynomial, e to the minus x squared over two. And if I write out all the factors here, uh, in the dimension full version, if I had any thought whatsoever. Just in a drawer. Putting back all the units here. see right away what is this. Well, again, we, we start with the equation that we annihilate the ground state. And in momentum space, this is the annihilation operator times i over root 2. And this, I can cancel. So what can you tell me about the momentum space wave function of the ground state? Look at that equation for position space. It's, also the same. The same. it's exactly the same in, this, in these characteristic units. So in the characteristic units, this guy is exactly the same. It's exactly the same Gaussian. It's also Gaussian. In dimensionless units with exactly the same width. Therefore, what are the excited states? Same. They're exactly the same, except there's some factor of i by convention. Right? So this thing is i to the n times you know, the 
whatever normalization constant I have, per me polynomial, is a minus p squared. Up to that phase convention, they're exactly the same. And this, again, is unique to the simple harmonic oscillator. And the reason is that in the simple harmonic oscillator, x and p are the same, right? The simple harmonic oscillator, the Hamiltonian, was x squared plus p squared with some units. So whatever is true for x is also true for p. So the position wave functions look just like the momentum wave functions. They're the same. It's the symmetry in x and p that makes the simple harmonic oscillator special. All right, we shall continue this discussion next time.